So I'm going to talk about uh, developing a dynamic multi-scale model of human hepatic uh, sugar metabolism. And um, the reason why we want to do this is essentially because of um, looking at the clinical disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or NAFLD, which is estimated to affect up to 30% of the UK, the general UK population. And it's basically a, a spectrum of liver diseases where we have um, uh, a fatty liver, we can see the liver droplets here, and it can progress to um, have the inflammation uh, and fibrosis shown in blue here, and it can progress to um, end-stage liver disease. And this is important because um, well, we have an increased trend of uh, liver disease um, mortality rates there. And um, so, um, yeah, this is the only major cause of disease that's still increasing year on year. And a large proportion of that is NAFLD. Um, and if we look at some uh, a diagram here where we see a trend of obesity, which is a major risk factor of NAFLD, uh, there's some correlations with sugar. And this is uh, evident in the US. Uh, some correlations down there. However, if you look at some data relevant to the UK, uh, there is this increased trend of obesity. However, we don't see that uh, trend for sugar intakes. So uh, what is sugar? It's 50% uh, glucose and 50% fructose. Uh, and particularly fructose, though, it's been under scrutiny in the media, saying it's fueling metabolic diseases. Uh, as far as being labeled as poison. So, however, the EFSA um, has a health food claim here for fructose saying that, in fact, it does have a lower glycemic response uh, after feeding, um, so it could be used as a sweetener. Uh, but there's some, obviously, contrasting messages there. So um, that's partly because the evidence in the scientific literature is also uh, conflicting. So you have here two studies uh, showing that fructose is more detrimentally um, affecting metabolic health. Uh, however, some other studies here show that there's no difference between fructose and glucose. Um, so if you look at the uh, molecular pathways, uh, both fructose and glucose can be taken up by the liver. And there can be substrates for de novo lipogenesis, um, or direct substrates for tags of this is here. And we have a big question mark there, and we know some differences between the metabolis, uh, metabolic pathways of the two sugars, um, but there's a lot of questions on the regulation and how they might affect uh, fatty liver disease. So um, hopefully with the aid of modeling, we can look into this. Um, so essentially we want to build a multi-scale model composed of a liver-specific genome-scale metabolic network, and we're using uh, cell culture data sets or uh, in vitro uh, data to parameterize this as much as we can um, and incorporate an insulin signaling response. So with sugar, you have insulin, uh, so it's sort of a first pass of a regulation that we can incorporate into this. Um, and essentially use these to predict sugar transport metabolism and see if this has an influence on tag production. And hopefully, uh, well, our hypothesis is that it will uh, predict regulatory and metabolic outcomes to physiological levels of glucose and fructose, uh, and what this means for healthy and fatty liver, and hopefully answer questions like if we should be looking or careful with sugars in regards to um, fatty liver disease. So here's an already published um, liver specific, or human liver specific uh, metabolic network, FatNet1. It's uh, quite comprehensive. Uh, and arguably to date still uh, the best one to use. Uh, it has two, over 200 or 2,500 uh, reactions and it's heavily based, up, based um, heavily backed up by literature because uh, it's manually curated. And I specialize this model to represent our in vitro system. By that I mean I use an external exchange set that represents our culture medium and these fluxes are um, constrained by a published data set showing the uh, releases and the consumption 
fluxes of cancer cell lines. That was measured by mass spec. Um, and we have this idea that these are very high metabolizing uh, cancer cells, so surely a healthy cell should be well within these ranges. So these are more trying to uh, capture the physiological post maximum and minimum uh, physiological, physiological ranges. Um, and because of the nature of these massive um, network models and for the reasons of our specific um, question that we want to answer, I had to make sure these were biologically correct. So there's a couple of little things I had to make well, more biologically correct. Um, so those changes were made. And so we were able to use this model uh, with our uh, novel computational approach, um, quasi steady state petronets, um, which is an algorithm that essentially integrates a genome scan metabolic network with a dynamic model uh, represented in Petronet's formalism. So here, um, just kind of showing the first instance of its um, structure here. So we have a Petronet 1. Uh, we constrain it by a biomass um, constraint, making sure that it can uh, have the amino acids and energy substrates to um, maintain biomass. Here I'm representing uh, glucose and fructose transport, just using a um, okay, this mint genetic activity. And um, we can monitor things like uh, any metabolite, really. But in the case of here, we're I'm measuring or monitoring tag production. And with um, using the specific reaction uh, as that we're interested in, as the um, objective function, and we're changing the sign of optimization from minimization to maximization uh, to get the complete scope um, of the possible ranges that we can get from this model. And uh, so essentially, we're um, doing an FVA and in incorporating dynamic um, tracking of that. So we're implementing dynamic flux variability analysis here. Um, so with that, we uh, want to incorporate uh, an insulin model, which we uh, have here. And this is a kinetic model. And so the first instance, I wanted to make sure I can replicate the results that were published. So I use capacity as the first instance uh, to confirm I can get the same behaviors and I uh, have been able to. And without the patronet component, here, just on its own, I was able to replicate those results in our uh, QSSP algorithm uh, pretty much exactly, so that was nice to, to confirm. And uh, with the QSSP algorithm, we had to label the connections with the Hetanet 1. So here I was able to label um, the um, protein glucose 6-phosphatase. Um, this protein essentially being the glycogen synthase and PUPCK. Um, and here, essentially, behind the scene is these activity lists where we label the enzyme and we have the concentrations um, and the lower and upper bounds in the third, second and third column there. So, this is very much a continuous uh, petronet form uh, that we're using here. And with the algorithm, it's able to, to integrate the two. Uh, and just to confirm in our in vitro model that um, it is insulin sensitive, here I'm just showing you with a Western blot. Uh, results showing that with physiological ranges of insulin, we get nearly two-fold increase, but super, super physiological range here, we get a very significant uh, eight-fold increase. So we're using that to make sure we can detect any differences there. And uh, first set of results, I'll just kind of explain what we've seen here. Um, so I'm simulating the in vitro glucose concentrations at 25 millimolar um, in the medium. And essentially, using the minimization uh, optimization there, we can see that glucose is being produced, which is what you'd expect a liver to be able to do with gluconeogenesis. Um, and then it's showing with the maximization that we are consuming glucose. And um, if you will, this gets sort of a solution space. And um, I've been able to do that with fructose, so showing with just fructose in the media, um, it's not really producing any, uh, but it is consuming at a slower rate, implemented by the Michaelis Minton equation there. Um, and with, so that was with um, zero insulin. So with 100 nanomolars insulin, you see that there's a slight decrease um, of the production of glucose. 
uh, that's been exported. And there's no real difference here with fructose. Um, and with our hep G2's cells, I was able to measure the, the glucose and fructose in the medium, and it fits nicely within the solution space um, in both the glucose and fructose. Uh, with, a, with zero uh, insulin stimulation, um, it gives you this, but with 100 nanomolars, it gives you a slight decrease. So you could see how it has a less potential of glucose production. Um, and to note that there's very minimal differences really between the two, and this is what we were able to capture as with our model as well. Um, so we concluded that we were able to give sort of realistic uh, ranges of glucose uptake and fructose uptake. So I want to test to see what those sugars, the impact of those sugars on tag production using this method. Uh, so we have tag production um, and again having uh, the minimum uh, from production of tag being along the axis here in dotted uh, line and the maximum uptake being this uh, increase in the amount of tag production here with zero amount of um, insulin stimulation. And this is for both glucose and fructose, and you can kind of see straight away there's not much difference really um, there. Uh, with 100, again, there's minimum um, uh, effect provided from the insulin stimulation. Um, and just to confirm that the model is using enough glucose because we're not optimizing glucose uptake anymore, we're purely looking at tag production. We just want to make sure that our model is taking up the sugar. So it is saying that um, this model is utilizing the glucose and fructose. Very many differences between the two uh, because of insulin stimulation. Uh, but more um, in detail, I just wanted to show the actual tag production. You can see more differences there. So here I want to just make sure that does tag even be, you know, is it produced even without the sugars? And, it's confirming that, yes, the other nutrients in the media that is able to produce tag. So there's other yeah, um, nutrients there that could provide the substrates there. Um, and with insulin in, uh, stimulation, there's a dip of tag production. And whenever I added glucose, it's providing extra sources of uh, substrates for tag production. And um, again, you see this dip of tag production, or, or yeah, in tag production whenever you have insulin stimulation. And if you look at fructose, there's pretty much no differences. And the only differences you see is at the very end when there's lack of substrate in the media to provide those, um, to provide for tag production. So um, just to conclude, uh, we're able to uh, reproduce our sugar uptake in vitro in our silicone model. Um, and at this instance, we were able to conclude that glucose and fructose are not limiting sources of tag production, but they do provide extra sources um, that provide uh, more tag, and uh, we weren't able to detect any differences between the two sugars. Um, however, further integration, in interrogation of the model, because of its large scales, we're having to um, look into other ways of um, analyzing this metabolic landscape of the changes that we can see between the two. So hopefully we can uh, have more time to do that in the future. And um, as I was showing you, more super physiological conditions where hopefully to scale that back and actually be able to see more physiological relevant conditions um, and make some more predictions to guide further research. So uh, I'd just like to thank my uh, supervisors. So um, currently still at Surrey, we have Nick Plant and um, the QSSPN master, um, Andre Kierzak and Bernadette who's moved recently to Leeds, and um, my co-supervisor at University of Reading, who's a DTP um, program, and lots of um, thanks for my other colleagues that has helped and support. So um, yeah, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Yeah. Um, I think it was the sense of trying to incorporate um, all the different elements of TAG, or sorry, uh, of liver metabolism. So liver is not just the sense of just producing TAG, it has other conditions of making albumin, it has conditions of making bile acids, and um, I think with the adoption of 
incorporated in Genome Scan Metabot Network, we were hoping to incorporate all those other abilities that the liver can do. It's, it's like hundreds, if not thousands, of functions the liver can do. So, um, the first instance, um, you know, we didn't incorporate any kinetic models. So the very uh, the first publication of QSSPN was very purely just qualitative behaviors we were monitoring and and uh, checking. But the the nice thing about the QSSPN is that we can we can later put in kinetic uh, components in there. And um, so, like I mentioned before, so um, the Petronet system there was purely just um, qualitative, but uh, I was able to actually put kinetic information into it. So that could be something that we could do in the future to um, to parameterize the model a bit more specifically to tag if we wanted to insert that in there. So there's there's potential to include that. But the first instance we wanted to see if there's um, if we can even kind of just even do it really. It's, it's it's early stages still. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm not very familiar with these continuous pattern nets, but yeah. are these continuous pattern nets and um, basically a description for a differential equation? Or uh, yeah, I think you um, you can. So I'm trying to think. So um, the actual Petronet, um, what I'm doing is the extended version, and I think with the um, the QSSPN algorithm, you're it's just taking in the um, kinetic list, the activity list there. I'm trying to think if um, if behind the scenes is actually using differential equations. I think purely if you are doing just uh, continuous Petronet, you can incorporate those um, outputs into it and it'll run that way. Did you model, uh, did you model consider the changes in the uh, Vmax and KM values of the exokinase and fructokinase? Because uh, at least in some uh, metabolic syndrome mm -hmm. experimental in models in rats, yeah. there is a switch in the to a higher affinity of the fructokinase yeah. instead of uh, the exokinase. So did you implement this? Uh, yeah, no, definitely. So yeah, mechanism? at the first instance, I haven't put those into it just yet. But what I had done was the actual transport uptake. So uh, taking into account um, the GLUT2, for example and the affinities for, for that particular transporter. After that, um, we can probably put in sort of uh, ratios of the fluxes that can represent the KMs of the, of the enzymes later. Um, but no, at the first instance, we haven't done that just yet. Um, as we were just, so more, yeah, so I suppose we're actually just modeling the transport at this instance and just checking to see how this influences the metabolism. But no, that definitely needs to be Something that we look into. The level of, of the kinase is also uh, very important for in, in inducing the hyperfluxemia and hyperinsulinemia. Yeah. Yeah. So with the insulin uh, model, we were able to capture some of the cascades from that, and we just incorporated those uh, values from the insulin model. Um, but definitely, in regards to the other enzymes that were involved, in, particularly in the sugar metabolism, that's yeah, that's definitely something we need to. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you again. Thank you.